It has been such a busy week for kickboxing. There is so much to talk about. Buakau is back in the K1 Max Grand Prix. Don Eguiabina was able to get three TKO victories in one night to win the glory light heavyweight Grand Prix. We're also talking Muay Thai with a fighter that I helped sponsor, Tyler Hogan. We also had one 167 with some key Muay Thai and kickboxing going down on it. And going on this weekend is a major event from Rise. This is part of their World Series 2024 in Osaka, and it has some amazing fighters on it. So let's get to it. We have so much to cover here. So let's talk about Buakau is the wild card pick who has now entered in the Grand Prix. This is a the K1 Max is back 155 pounds, just like it was with Giorgio Petrosian, just like it was with Buakau, just like it was with Masato Kobayashi and so many other legends in that K1 Max era. Now they're bringing back K1 Max and trying to capture some of the magic of the original. So they started with 14 fighters earlier this year where all of them had to fight and win to move to the next seven. But when you have seven, that's still not enough for a tournament. So there was still a wild card that could be anybody. Some people thought it might be Masaki Nori or Sidichai or Marat Gregorian was rumored. There was a lot of other rumors. Even Shingiz Alazov and uh, Tajani Bestadi was rumored to be in that area that they might be the wild card. In the end, it was Buakau. The legend, the two-time K1 Max champion back in the 2000s, who's still actively fighting. 42 years old, and he's still fighting. And he got the toughest draw in the tournament. He is facing the person that nobody wanted to fight. They did a draw earlier this year, and nobody wanted to fight Wu Yang Fang. He is the current K1 champion. He is the uh, WLF champion, and he is currently top ranked in this division. And nobody wanted to fight him, but now Buakau has to fight Wu Yang Fang. So later this year, this is going to be on July 7th. It will be a one night tournament at 155 pounds for all of these fighters. You have Uyang Feng versus Buakau, the legend. Denge Silva versus Daryl Verdonk. Daryl Verdonk is the infusion champion. Victor Akimov versus Romano Bakbord. And then you have Kasper Muszynski from Poland will face Zora Okapian. So the favorite to win the entire tournament, no doubt, is Uyang Fang. Should be able to get past uh, Buakau. Buakau is certainly not in his prime, even though he has a couple wins in the last couple of years. Let's not kid ourselves and say that he's in his prime. He is 42 years old. And uh, yeah, he's coming off of a very impressive win, a second round knockout against Minoru Kimura. And that was a major surprise. He should uh, like that was that was a very impressive win. Prior to that, he was defeating Nayanesh Aman in RWS kickboxing, had a few no contests and stuff like that, was able to defeat Anpo. Actually, now that I'm looking at it, maybe maybe he was able to win because he beat K1 champions uh, Kimura and Anpo in the last couple of years here. Uh, in bare knuckle Muay Thai, he was able to defeat Sanshai, but had such a height advantage it didn't height and size advantage that it wasn't too important. But the overall career of Buakau is just incredible. This guy is one of the most important people in kickboxing history with his multiple K1 Max world titles. He was also the Wulun Fang world champion, Omnoi stadium champion in Muay Thai, WMC champion, Thai fight, WBC champion, all these other titles. But really what was happening when, when K1 was just exiting the golden age K1 Max came up and entered its own kind of diamond era of the lighter weight classes. And they made legends, like I was saying, with Giorgio Petrosian and Masato Kobayashi and Buakau. And he was one of the key people to to present Muay Thai to the entire world in a competitive way because he showed up in the first year where he wasn't a favorite and he was almost unknown in the very first year that he competed. Trust me, after the 2004 year, he was no longer an unknown. But yeah, he showed up beating John Wayne Parr and then Masato in the final. And then after that, everyone knew who Buakau was and things were things were changed. He then became the the it guy that was you know Im impossible to beat and he was the face of the sport and he fought legends like he fought other legends within his range like uh andy sauer mike zambides he fought andy sauer jean charles skarbowski mike zambides giorgio petrosian masada kobayashi uh tons and tons of other people nikki holtzkin of course like tons and tons of people just anyone who was named in the sport during that era would have likely fought bua cow but now he's back. He's going to be competing in the K1 Max Grand Prix on July 7th, and he will be taking on Young Fang, and this is at 155 pounds. Is he likely to win? It's a pretty tough draw. If he was against some of the other guys that I don't know so well, you know, yeah, maybe. But he is against the top-ranked, very dangerous Young Fang from China, who holds titles in K1 and WLF and elsewhere since 2020. 
Ouyang Fang has picked up 24 victories with just one loss in that time. Very, very impressive resume for this young man, and I expect him to probably be a future star. I mean, he's likely to beat Buakao. I'm sorry to all the fans tuning in and expect me to say otherwise, but yes, he is likely to beat Buakao, and he is likely to win the entire tournament. But if you are looking for a dark horse in the tournament, it's probably going to be Kasper Muszynski from Poland. He's just coming off of a unanimous decision win against Stoyan Kropolevinsky, and Stoyan Kropolevinsky was my previous dark horse to win the entire tournament, as he had very, very close losses to people like Tajani Bestadi and Kaito Ono, uh, and, and arguably beat those people, and uh, but yeah, I just had close losses to them, but then he didn't have a close loss against Kasper Muszynski. Kasper Muszynski beat him. So yeah, I, I would expect the finals to probably be Casper versus Wu Young Fang, but uh, yeah, tournaments produce very interesting and very odd results. So if someone gets injured, someone gets hurt, who knows? Wu Young Fang might get the legs kicked out from under him and struggle to get to the next round of the tournament or struggle in the next fight, and then he drops out. And uh, yeah, it's a very dangerous people in the tournament. Like Daryl Verdonk is very good. Dengue Silva. Yeah, it's a, it's going to be an exciting at Grand Prix there on July seventh. Speaking of Grand Prix, let's move to the Glory Light Heavyweight Grand Prix that just happened this past week. On a recent job application, it asked me, name a hero in your life and explain why this person is your hero. And I thought, I don't know who to put, maybe Donegi Abina, because he is now my lifelong hero. This guy, three TKO victories. And we're going to talk about the entire tournament. Don't worry, I'm going to be talking about every fight in this tournament. But let's just talk about Donegi Epina. Three knockout victories in one night. What is most impressive about the career of Donegi Epina is his relentless willpower and his passion to improve. He struggled in his early career. He was an extremely young man who was facing the best of the best. And he struggled in some of those fights. So what did he do? He changed gyms and reinvented himself and came back even stronger. So after very tough and close losses, he came back with more determination and more strength and more skills. And he was able to pick up the division light heavyweight title. And he looked good doing so. And then when he lost the title in a very close decision and a very controversial decision, what did he do? He didn't get discouraged. He got more determined. And he came back with three knockout victories in one night. Three knockout victories in a row and avenged his prior loss and has now captured the Grand Prix, the tournament light heavyweight title. That is absolutely incredible. The determination of this young man. When everything is down, when everything matters most, he gets better. He continues to improve. No matter what happens to him, no matter, no matter what the situation is, what does he do? He continues to improve. And he has a really interesting story growing up with him and his brothers. He was extremely angry. He was moving home to home. And that is a recipe for a person who maybe gives up. But instead, what he did in his life, he continued to get better. He continued to improve and he continued to strive for a better life. And then when he loses in fighting, he gets better. He moves camps. He listens to his coaching staff. He just continuously improves when life gets hard. And that is an extremely impressive skill to have in your life. And for me, that is why Donegi Abina is a hero of mine. Let's start with the first fight on the card. Sem Ciceras was able to knock out Muhammad Amine with a left hook. This was a brutal one. And this was the tournament reserve bout. So if in case anyone you know dropped out due to injury or whatever it might be, the winner of this fight would step in. And uh, Sam Ciceras was able to defeat Muhammad Amine by the pretty mean knockout, turning the head entirely around. First fight on the tournament card, Tariq Kababez and Pascal Touré threw down. Now, Tariq Kababez won this fight. Clearly, he landed more, landed better throughout. He was the much more effective fighter throughout this fight. Pascal Touré is an extremely heavy and strong kicker. So Tariq was trying to shut that down by doing his usual game, which is to close the distance and land strikes on the inside, whether it's going to be a flurry of punches or whether it's going to be kicks or whatever it might be. He's trying to get you against the ropes, pin you there, and then throw in combination. And especially against a strong kicker who wants to kick from the distance, that's a really wise decision to make. That's a very wise game plan. Pascal Touré was landing extremely heavy leg kicks. They just weren't enough to stop Tariq Kababez. But over the three rounds in this fight, he was able to land enough leg kicks that I even said it on Twitter. 
I said, as he continues in this tournament, that leg might be compromised and that leg might become an issue because look, it's the first round of the tournament. He fought three full rounds against a heavy, heavy leg kicker and he was forced to change stances because of how much pain his legs were in. And that's a tough, tough recipe if you want to fight two more times in the same night. So he clearly won the fight and it was an exciting fight. And it was a really fun fight. He was getting to the inside, uh, trying to land flurries, trying to land kicks. Awesome. Awesome to see. But Pascal Touré maybe won this entire tournament with the leg kicks and that changed the entire face of the tournament. But I'm looking forward to seeing even more of this man. So Tariq Kababez with that victory is able to qualify for the semifinals. Sorry, semifinals. Yeah, semifinals. The next fight is Donegi Abina versus Stefan Latuscu. And I was saying this is the toughest fight for me to pick on the card, and I was stupid for saying so. Like, Donegi Abina completely outclassed him, completely outstruck him everywhere. He was completely able to evade the strikes from Stefan Latuscu, kick out the legs from under him. Um, and it was just looked like a skilled, skilled kickboxer versus someone just trying to knock your head off. And it was a brutal, brutal finish from Donegi Abina, who kicked him right in the shin. And clearly, Stefan Latuscu was injured from this. He stepped back, he stumbled and, and limped away because of how hard Donegi Abina kicked his shin. And then while there was a little bit of time, uh, Donegi kicked him right in the head. Now, people are saying like it's kind of controversial. The referee was trying to step in and all that stuff. Referee wasn't there, kicked him in the head fairly squarely. That's it. That's if the referee wasn't in your way, kick your opponent all you want. So yeah, Donegi Abina, uh, uh, Donegi Abina defeated him, certainly with no issue, didn't take a lot of injuries in the fight, didn't take a lot of damage in the fight. And, and if it didn't end via TKO in the third round and went to a full decision, Donegi Abina would have taken it no problem. He was out striking him from, from bell to bell there. So now Don Nagy Abina is in the semifinal round, and then later in the evening, he's going to have to face Tariq Kabab as someone he's been scheduled against a lot and then had uh, someone he has been scheduled against several times and lost the title to in a prior championship fight. Next fight, the return of Sergei Maslaboyev, the former division champion who already has wins over people like Donegi Abina, Bahram Rajabzada, Tariq Kababez, and others. He lost the title controversially due to a cut against Donegi Abina, a cut to his shin. And he was rightly, and he was absolutely pissed off about this. He said, the doctor didn't even take a close look at that cut. This is complete BS. I'm able to fight through this. It's not a problem. All that stuff. And he lost the title due to the cup, but yeah, he was not a happy guy. So he went back and fought in KOK and then returned to glory to claim what was rightfully his or what he believes is rightfully his, which is at the top of the division. And this is why before the Grand Prix began, I was so excited for this division because so many of these people have fought each other before in really exciting bouts. Like Donegi Abina has fought Tariq Kababez and Sergey Masaboyev in great fights. Tariq Kababez has fought Donegi Abina and, and Sergey Masaboyev in, in absolutely classic, classic fights. And then you got knockout guys like Bahram Rajabzada and Stefan Latescu in it. And you have talented kickers like Pascal Torre. Just an awesome, awesome division where it's just, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit, but Sergey Masloboyev fought Bogdan Stoika, the top ranked Bogdan Stoika, and Sergey Masloboyev looked so motivated going into this. He rushed at him, he ran at him and started landing punches in combination and did give, did, did, and he did not give Bogdan Stoika an inch of space. He just continued to move forward, throwing flurries and punches in combinations. And then he threw a knee, which was blocked, and Bogdan Stoika broke his arm because of that knee or fractured his arm or whatever it might be. So this is just one minute into the bout and Sergey Masaboyev has landed a flurry of strikes and broken his opponent's arm. And because of that, Bogdan Stoika, of course, his arm's broken. He can't continue. He goes down. He's waved off by the referee. One minute, five seconds into the fight, Sergey Masaboyev is back in glory in the winner's column. Huge, huge congratulations to Sergei Masloboyev. Looked great, looked motivated, and I'm excited to see more from him as he is promoted to the semi-final round. Next fight, everyone's favorite, Bahram Rajabzada will take on Ibrahim El Benoui. Bahram Rajabzada was just qualified for the heavyweight Grand Prix and did quite well in it. So in the heavyweight division, um, you know, he, what I've talked about with him is he reminds me so much of that early pride early valet to do Vanderlei Silva, just a flurry of aggressive punches, 
uh, in kicks, trying to tie you up in the clinch and land aggressive and hard knees. In glory, he was able to knock out Muhammad Amine, Luis Tavares. He was able to defeat Uku Yuriendal. He was able to defeat Tariq Osaro. He had a close and exciting fight against the heavyweight Levy Rigters and then came back and knocked out Kevin Umar to qualify for the light heavyweight Grand Prix. So he's been jumping up and down heavyweight and light heavyweight and knocking out a ton of people and competing against people who are way bigger than him. He fought the biggest guys at heavyweight and the hardest hitters with Uku Yuriendal, Tariq Kuki Osaro, and Levy Rigters. And uh, yeah, had no problem surviving against those guys, really. And against Ibrahim El-Banoui, he ran at him. He flurried against him and uh, made it look like it was an easy fight for him. So he he was able to knock out Ibrahim El-Banoui via a flying knee officially in the first round, just two minutes into the fight. And it was super exciting. And you could tell that the crowd was on his side from the moment he walked out to the moment the decision was read out to his post-fight speech. The crowd was on the side of Bahram Rajab Zeta. Everyone likes an exciting fighter who comes forward. He has no regard for his own safety. He will take one punch to land a flurry of strikes. You know, that's the kind of guy he is. He wants to draw you into a brawl. If you don't brawl, he's just going to continue to overwhelm you. So he moves to the semifinal round and will then next face Sergei Maslaboyev. So both Sergei Maslaboyev and Bahram Razabzeda have fought combined three minutes, whereas Donegi Abina and Tariq Kababez on the other side of the tournament have both fought three full rounds. So you're seeing quite a difference here on the two sides of the tournament. Next fight of the night, nobody gets a break. There's no fights in between. This isn't K1. K1 used to take like 12 hours for a broadcast. I'm, I'm being hyperbolic, but not by very much. I remember K1 used to do, I think, like seven hour broadcasts and then COVID, they got even longer and stuff like that because they used to have intermissions. But this isn't K1. This is the Glory Grand Prix. Nobody gets any breaks. We're not taking any intermissions. The next fight, like I don't even think they took their gloves off, but you have Don Egi Abina facing Tariq Kababeth. Now this is a championship rematch from just a few months ago that ended in a, a controversial decision where Tariq Kababez took the title off of Don Egi Abina. Tariq Kababez came out in a, a switched stance, clearly trying to protect the leg that was damaged by Pascal Torre earlier in the night. And Donegi Abina tracked it right away. He was able to kick the leg. Even if he took a couple of punches, if he kicked that back leg, he knew it would affect Tariq. And yeah, he targeted the leg quite a few times in the first round and it was clearly, clearly causing a painful reaction from the tank, Tariq Kababez. And yeah, Donegi Abina was able to win this fight via second round TKO by low kicks. And yeah, when you're coming in injured from a prior fight, that's bound to happen. But good for Tariq Kababez, really showed his medal that... You know, he, he given the damage he sustained in winning the prior fight, he could have dropped out and said, like, dude, I have welts growing on my leg. I can't put any weight on my leg. Get Sam Ceseris in there because I cannot compete. And nobody would have minded that. Everyone would have understood. But instead, he said, no, nope, I can't stand on my leg. I can still fight. And he lasted a round and a half against the champion, Donegi Abina. And good for Tariq Kababez toughing it out like that. But yeah, professionals at this over... 200 pounds, over 100 kilograms, kicking your leg for more than 10 minutes, you're not going to be able to walk. And Donegi Abina showed that. And he targeted the leg and fought it wisely. And I expect these two to rematch down the line. The first fight ended controversially. Tariq Kababez could argue that this fight was won because of his previous fight, which is totally fair. Uh, but regardless, Donegi Abina, two knockout wins in a row tonight, and he looks tactical and he looks smart doing it. He hasn't taken much damage because he's been able to outpoint these guys, and they look like they are almost a clip behind him. They look like they're fighting on a lower gear, and he is beating them. So Donegi Abina, he is now entered in the finals. The next semifinal bout, Bahram Rajab Zeta versus Sergei Maslaboyev. They have met once before years ago with Sergei Maslaboyev getting the nod. Now both of them are coming off first round knockout wins just minutes ago, and now they meet. And it is a barn burner. It is a back and forth fight. Bahram Rajab Zeta is an overwhelming striker who wants to get into the inside and brawl. Sergei Maslaboyev is willing to, but he is so good at distance. He's looking to land jabs. He's looking to land jabs and leg kicks and hold you off from a distance. And that way he can get to the inside and flurry. And these two were throwing down. The first round was completely even with maybe Sergey. Uh, the, the first round was completely even. It was a very, very close round. Bahram Razab Zeta probably was slightly ahead and all the judges did score the round for him. But it was still a very, very close round and a very, very competitive fight. And I remember saying on Twitter or, or sorry, X, uh, in between the first and second round that regardless of what happens between these two, 
I would like to see a rematch because already this fight is just cooking. This fight is awesome. This is already with this one round. This is one of the best fights of the night. So win or lose, I don't care whether it's in the finals or whatever it might be. I don't care what happens to the guy. I want to see a rematch between Bahram Rajab Zeta and Sergey Massaboyev. And so that's just between the first and second round. Then we get to the second round and this is where some drama finally kicks in. And no, Remember what I was talking about with Sergey Maslaboyev losing his last fight due to cut on his leg. Bahram Rajab Zeta and Sergey Maslaboyev get into it. They get into a brawl and then an accidental headbutt from Sergey Maslaboyev splits the lip open of Sergey Maslaboyev. And that's pretty rough. It's an accidental headbutt. It's inadvertent, but it is an illegal move. You definitely can't do it. The doctor takes a look at the lip. The laceration of Sergei Masaboyev. According to Sergei, he could he could put his tongue out of the he could stick his tongue through it because it was wide open laceration. And I think the doctor knew about prior protests. And he said, Sergei, you're fine to fight if you would like to continue. And I think what Sergei Masaboyev was trying to say to the referee and doctor was: look, he did an illegal move that caused damage to me. Are you going to punish him? Are you going to disqualify him? Because he opened a cut on my face using an illegal move inadvertent or not. It was an illegal move that caused me damage. Are you going to do anything about it? And I bet they said no. And then he said, F it. I'm out. So he kind of, you know, TKO retirement because he was not willing to continue. He wasn't really willing to continue because of the cut. I think he was protesting, trying to get to the officials, trying to tell the officials like, look, I've, I, I, with this cut, even if I win this fight, I can't continue to the next round of the tournament. You have to punish Bahram Rajab Zeta for this illegal move. And they kind of said, like, no, it was an accident. And that's fair. That's completely reasonable. It was an accidental, inadvertent headbutt. There's not much you can do about that. It sucks. So the doctor's saying, look, you can continue if you want. The referee's saying, look, you can continue if you want. I'm not sure if they negotiated. Do you take a point from Bahram Rajab Zeta? Do you, I don't know, you can't just disqualify him in a tournament like this, in a championship fight? I don't know. I don't know. But I think Sergey Mesoboyev was frustrated from his prior TKO cut loss. And then talking to the doctor in this one, I think he's like, guys, get some consistent policy going on the officiating. What is the rule here? I understand it's a tournament. But regardless, even if you said this fight was a no contest, because you're not over the halfway point, In if you're over the halfway point, you could probably go to the judge's scorecard and then continue that way. Um, but you weren't at the halfway point, so you'd have to call it a no contest. But because it was a tournament, they needed a winner. And I think they still could have called it a no contest and then have Bahram continue to the next round. And that would have been okay. But I think... Uh, due to the protests of Sergey, they called it TKO retirement, saying he quit. So, you know, there was negotiations going on with the with the officiating in the corner, so I'm not sure what was discussed. But yeah, with these, when an illegal move happens by accident and a fighter is not able to continue, it's still a point of contention in all sports about what we need to do, especially what you need to do at a level this high. When we're doing a tournament final for a championship between two fighters who are champions, you know what I mean? So there, it was a tough decision to make, and I, I don't think that there was any decision that could have been made here from officiating or Sergey or anyone like that that would have pleased all the fans. I think regardless, you're going to piss off a bunch of fans. And this definitely pissed off a bunch of fans, but that was Sergey's decision. But he was protesting because it was a legal move. He wanted no contest probably or whatever it might be. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that sucks. It, it just sucks for him. Losing via, t- he lost his title due to cut and then he loses in the tournament due to cut, but not really because he kind of quit. But he kind of quit because he was trying to make a point. And that, that just sucks. And like it, like I said, regardless of the result, I do want to see more than anything a rematch between Bahram Rajab Zeta and Sergey Masaboyev because it ended controversially, And but the fight was cooking. The fight was so good up until the finish. And then it was just amazing. But yeah, it was, it was such a good fight. I loved every second of this fight. This was so much fun. So Bahram Rajab Zeta now is in the finals because of this win. And this is what everybody predicted. Bahram is the favorite, the odds-on favorite to take the entire tournament going in. And now finally, these guys get a little break. We have a middleweight fight that was pretty good. It ended via a split decision. I don't have any big comments on it. And then you have a heavyweight fight with Yonat Yansu knocking out Marat Agun. Now, Marat Agun has experience all over the heavyweight divisions, fought in one, fought in glory. Really, really skilled and impressive fighter. And he was winning this fight. He was winning this fight pretty dominantly. He was landing at will, looking good. One, twos. We're clearly landing at a clip. The first round, towards the end, he gets slammed with a huge lead hook, and he goes down. And you can see the frustration on his face. They go to the corner. You can see how frustrated he is. He's saying, no, no. It's like a nightmare for him, right? Winning this fight so cleanly, winning this fight with no problem. And then you're dropped. 
one of the best rounds of your life, in fact, when you get dropped, so you lose it. Couldn't be worse for him. And then the second round, they throw down. They are brawling. They are throwing back and forth. But honestly, Marat Agun is getting the better in exchanges. The problem is Ionat. But the problem is Yonat Yansu has so much power that he can lose in exchanges. But he lands one punch at the end and his opponent goes down. And that's all she wrote. He has so much power in his hands. He's a, he is a full-size big heavyweight with tons of punching power. And he is tough as nails. And he knocks out Marat Agun in the second round via hook and and this was a brutal brutal knockout Marat Agun was face down he was out cold and that was brutal to see but yeah Yonat Yansu moves up in the heavyweight division this was his uh Yonat Yansu moves up and he is now ranked in the heavyweight division he's now you know pair him up with Cookie Tariko Saro or you know any of these really top guys because he's an exciting pick for this division and uh yeah this was his debut but it was a pretty good way to make a debut but I think it's going to be very tough for him to move forward because he likes to get hit in the head a lot, but he really relies on his punching power. But yeah, no, I'll watch the next few fights for him. He's going to be a really exciting fighter to keep an eye on. So now we reach the tournament final. Bahram Rajab Zeta taking on Donegi Abina. And you can hear in the audience, Bahram Rajab Zeta is getting the pop. He is the crowd favorite. He is the odds on favorite to win. He is the betting favorite to win the tournament. And now he's in the finals and he hasn't taken a ton of damage so far. He won his first fight via knockout in just two minutes. He won a second fight by knockout in the second round. Donegi Abina, he's looking pretty good. He has taken no damage because of how evasive and elusive he has fought to this point, but he has won his prior two fights in this tournament via knockout and look good doing it. And the crazy thing is Donegi Abina had this look on his face in every fight that he was so focused and so dialed in it didn't look like a person who was about to get in a fist fight. It looked like a person about to take a calculus test or something like that. He just completely focused, completely in the zone. And this fight was the same thing because Bahram Rajab Zeta looks like a guy who would take your head off. And he kind of looks like that all the time. But Donegi Abina, he's ready. He's got his calculator ready. He's ready for this fight. He's so dialed in. And the two start throwing down, and it's a really fun, exciting fight. It's some good back-and-forth action. Uh, uh, Bahram Rajab Zeta is landing some kicks that later Donegi Abina would say are insanely powerful, but he is trying to land on the head and kind of struggling to, to find the mark. But he, he lands a couple of punches. Donegi Abina is landing to the legs. He is landing to the head. He is finding the mark a few times, and it is looking quite good. And then Bahram Rajab Zeta throws a scissor knee, and Donegi Abina steps back, and times it perfectly with a left hook. He counters it with a left hook, and Bahram, his head is completely turned around, and he goes down, and the fight maybe went on from there, but it didn't matter. That was the end of the fight there. Bahram was not able to recover. Now, put this into context of how good that moment was. The timing, the accuracy, the speed, everything about this, the precision of that punch. Because Bahram Rajab Zeta is a guy who has fought Sluggers, Levy Richters, Uku Yuriendal, Cookie Tariko Zaro, heavyweight division sluggers. And then he fights guys like Sergey Maslaboyev and, and others like that. And you don't knock him down. You don't knock him out. But Donegi Abina knocks him out, basically with one punch. Absolutely incredible. The fight goes on a bit, and the referee really gives Bahram a lot of space to recover. Uh, Donegi Abina is really pouring it on, scores a couple more knockdowns. But yeah, he, the, they, they, they gave him every opportunity to recover. But yeah, Bahram, just his headspace was not in it at that point, And that's insane to see. But Donegi Abina was able to win the light heavyweight Grand Prix by three knockout wins in one night. And what a lineup. This guy beats Stefan Letescu. He beats Tariq Kababes. He beats Bahram Rajab Zeta. That is a key moment in the history of this sport. That is a key moment in the career of Donegi Abina. It doesn't get much better than that. How unreal, how exciting this sport is. All of these moments feels like it's been building to this moment. And all you want at the end of this is more because the entire tournament was so exciting. It's such a great division. I can't wait to see all these guys back. Donegi Gabina, he says, what's next for me? I want a vacation. I don't blame him. I understand. He's been in the pits. He's been fighting for championship fights for, for months now, for all year. It feels like he's been in championship fights and he's had some tough ones and he has a one night tournament and it's just, it's just war for him from belt to belt. Bahram Rajab Zeta, he says, what's next for me? I need a break. He says, I fought 10 times in the last 12 months, and he has. 
I need a bit of a rest. And I have a foot injury, he says, but Donegia beat him, beat him fairly squarely. Donegia beat him, just one of those guys. Like I said, my new hero, my hero of the sport, my hero in life, this guy, when all the chips are down, he comes through. When it matters most, it comes through. He struggled in the past, whether it be in life or in the ring, and he comes back stronger. There is no quit in this man. Donegi Abina, the light heavyweight champion. So what do I want to see next? Well, all these guys can take a rest, heal their bruises, heal their, their bad, bad cuts. It's unfortunate because I don't think most of these guys are going to be back for like six months. Donegi Abina, Bahram Rodgers, Sergei Maslaboyev, Tariq Kavavez are all pretty injured at this point and probably can't make it back for a long, long time. But I do want to see all of them back as soon as possible. I would love to see Bahram Rajab Zeta versus Sergey Masaboyev. Maybe we'll do the trilogy, the final match of Tariq Kababes versus Donegi Abina. Maybe you do a, uh, oh, I don't know, Stefan Latescu versus... Maybe you do a Stefan Latescu versus a Pascal Torre. Maybe you get an Ibrahim El Benoui versus a Bogdan Stoika. You know, there's there's no bad matchups in this division. The glory has invested into the light heavyweight division and it's paid off. And this is this was an exciting night of fights. Check it out. Uh, there's some highlights on the YouTube. There's some highlights that have been running next to my head. There's been some photographs there. Once if you I think you can still buy it. Most of us would be on Triller or wherever. I'm not really sure in your country, but I think you can still buy it and it's like 10, 10 bucks and it's not as hugely expensive, but it's a ton of fun to watch. Um, but yeah, I probably will be on their YouTube in two months or so and then it'll be free for you. Yeah. Great night of fights, but yeah, let's take, um, yeah, let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, we'll talk one, one, six, seven, uh, which was another really good card. Thank you for listening to the calf kick sports network. Make sure to check out more interviews, highlights, and podcasts on the interview channels. Additionally, make sure to check out Calf Kick Sports on Instagram. Links for all of these will be down below. Now, back to the show. Uh, let's start. Welcome back, folks, and thanks for tuning in. We are going to be talking some 1167 action. I think the best way to do this is start at the top and then work my way down. And of course, what we're going to start with is the main event, the championship match between Smoke and Joe Natawat taking on Tawan Shai, PK Sanshai for his Muay Thai title. This was an earlier rematch. The two fought in kickboxing and it was a pretty close fight, but I mean, uh, Tawan Shai showed that he was the better fighter. And then in this fight, Smoke and Joe Natawat was able to do extremely, extremely well and maybe almost take the title. It was a controversial decision where Tawan Shai was given the decision via majority. So one person said it was a draw that's fair and then the other two said it was for Tom and Shai now I think this is the fourth round was really the split round because I think three and five were clearly for Joe and one and two were clearly for Tom and Shai I think it was the fourth round that was very close where you know Joe did well early and then Tom and Shai did well later on in the round and uh but yeah the thing is like did did uh Smoke and Joe Nadawa get robbed I wouldn't say that in a fight this close. Robbery is completely the wrong term. You could say that you scored it for Smoke and Joe, and that's totally fair. That is entirely reasonable. You could say that you scored it a draw, and that too is completely fair and completely reasonable. You could say that you scored it for Tawanshai, and I think with how close that fight was, that is completely fair. That is completely reasonable. Smoke and Joe was able to have a lot of success over the fight and adjusting from the first two rounds and adjusting from their first fight by doubling up on the same side. So what I really saw a lot from him was like, he would do a, a body kick on the, his right side and then throw a cross with the same side with his right side, or he was doubling up with his crosses. So double jab, double cross, double straight, that sort of thing. And I think he was having a lot of success that way, but the stuff that you consistently saw from him would be the, mounting all of his offense from the body kick. So whether it be his body kick gets caught and then he throws a punch or he has Tom Shai reaching for a fake body kick and then he throws a punch over the top. But he he had a lot of success and he, and he landed a lot of really good punches in this fight. I don't know what you do next with both guys, whether you want to do a rematch. It is two nothing in close fights. But yeah, th and this is more what Tom Shai was was known for when he was on the stadium scene and just starting out in one. He wasn't the bone breaker for his entire career. He slowly developed into it. But even his fights against like Petra Morricott and Smoke and Joe and, and Superbon, you see this guy who's just very um, one point ahead and then cruises to a decision. It's 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 much more rare that he gets on the gas pedal and just knocks guys out. 
Uh, but yeah, Smoking Joe and Adawat had a, had a ton of success by staying aggressive, taking the center, and then pushing against them, but having a lot of success with same side attacks from the right side because uh, Tomashai was reacting. But yeah, ultimately Tomashai got the nod, and I have I, I don't have any issue with that. I you know it's maybe you have him rematch again, uh, maybe not. I I don't know. You let me know what you think is best here, uh, and maybe who you had winning. But I think we can all agree it's a close fight. Again, robbery is the wrong term in a fight this close. It could have been scored either way. And no matter what scorecard you give me in the comments, I'm going to say that's completely reasonable. That is completely fine in every way. No issue with that at all. Uh, but yeah, fun, fun fight. Definitely check it out on YouTube if you can, because uh, Tawan Chai and Smoke and Joe Natawat absolutely threw down, and it was a ton of fun. I love the catch kicks. I love the 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 tie. Sorry. I, I love the, the, the clinch exchanges that these two had. Uh, but yeah, this was a, a great, great fight here. And then you had the balls to the wall, absolute war between Rod Tang and Dennis Pierich. Now, before this fight, I was given Dennis Pierich a ton, a ton of chances to say like, this is the fight of his life and he has to put it on Rod Tang here. It's a kickboxing bout. Both guys have Muay Thai background, but this is the fight of his life here. Rod Tang has been in and out of training in the past or injured or maybe he's lacking motivation. This is the moment. The culmination of Dennis Puritan's life, and he put it all on the line against Rod Tang, and he looked good. But my God, this is this is among the best Rod Tang that I've ever seen in here. He is slipping, he is countering, he has inside counters going. Now Dennis Puritan did well by staying on his feet because it looked like he was heading for a first round knockout, and there was moments in the second and third rounds where it looked like he was getting knocked out, but he stayed on his feet, and every time he was hit, he answered back with a flurry of punches. He gritted his teeth. He showed it. He showed off, he, he showboated to the audience just like Rod Tang does. Oh, it was an awesome, awesome, awesome fight. It was a ton of fun. But yeah, this is among the best Rod Tang that uh, I think we've seen in a few years. And he is, like, I love his inside counters where he's, his opponent just misses by an inch, but he punches to the inside. Or he just slips to the outside and it's, it's just a slight, slight dodge and he punches to the inside. Absolutely expert, expert work here. And a really good way to take care of an aggressive striker. Now, one thing I've often said, and, and, and maybe people disagree with me, and I have no problem with that, and maybe people feel otherwise, but I think Rod Tang's style really does lend itself better to kickboxing than it does to Muay Thai, because he can get to the inside a lot safer without any issues of the clinch or elbows and stuff like that. And I think this fight and his last fight in kickboxing um, really showed like how good he is in kickboxing. And if he, he has no threat of the elbow, he has no threat of the clinch, he can just really get on the inside and brawl with these guys. And in every brawling situation, he was outpointing Dennis Purich. And Dennis was still landing a few really big punches. He landed hooks. He landed overhands in this fight. And Rod Tang didn't even need to shrug them off because he walked through it. Imagine hitting a person with a full power strike as hard as you can possibly hit. And their head doesn't even move. And they continue to walk forward. That's insane. Rod Tang, one of the toughest nails fighters, and and one of these guys who's really defining the entire generation of Muay Thai. This era of Muay Thai is defined by Rod Tang. And now Dennis Pierich, you know, yeah, I think he's 39 or 40 years old or something like that, but good for him. He's in that Liam Harrison, Sexan kind of area where uh, one championship loves you because you put on great fights. Every time out, he puts on entertaining fights. He's willing to risk his own safety, take one punch to land five kind of guy. And one championship loved that stuff. So he, he has a safe position for the rest of his career. Now, maybe they do the rematch running back because of how exciting this fight was. Maybe you do a rematch in Muay Thai. I think with small four ounce gloves, Rod Tang definitely gets the knockout. I no doubt about that. Um, there was areas where uh, Dennis Pierich was trying to catch the kick and walk forward, or there's a few moments where he could have clinched. But I think in Muay Thai, this fight is much more dominant for, for Rod Tang. I think he gets the knockout in smaller gloves. But regardless, this was a great brawl. This was a great fight. We really added to both guys' highlight reel, but Rod Tang comes away looking like an all around champion. He comes away looking absolutely awesome. What a great performance from Rod Tang, the guy who's defining this generation. Now, he did miss weight ahead of it by, I think, three pounds or something like that. And honestly, people get so up in arms about, about weight misses that, ah, man, yeah, if that bugs you, that's fine. Hey, that's great. Be mad. Be, be outraged. I just, you have to really pick and choose the things that you get mad about in this life. You only have so much time on the earth. And like Rod Tang missing weight for a fist fight, I, I don't care. I just, I don't know. 
maybe you can find other videos of me having a double standard where I cared hugely or whatever it might be. But yeah, Rod Tang misses weight. That sucks. It happens sometimes. Whatever. He's in a fist fight the next day. I don't care. It's not that I'm saying like everyone should be a professional and definitely make weight. Blah, blah, blah. Yes. Make weight. Be a professional. Definitely. But I'm just not going to get that emotional or up in arms about it. Like it just, 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 it's okay. You, if you're mad about it, go be mad. But I don't, I don't really care. I just, I can't emotionally get invested in something like that. And I'm emotionally invested in a lot of weird things. Like I cover kickboxing for a living. You got to understand how weird of a guy I am. Okay, let's go down to Masaki Nori is making his uh, debut in one championship against Sidichai. This is Masaki Nori, who was the champion in K1 versus uh, Sidichai, who was a champion in different stadiums in glory for a long, long time. He's held titles all around the world, but he's kind of on the other side of his career right now. He's taken a couple of losses. Uh, he's certainly not quite what he used to be, but he's still very tactical and very intelligent and a very good striker. Masaki Nori was a great fighter in K1 largely because he was fighting people and, and he had a really good highlight reel, but largely because he was fighting people who were just pretty good. He wasn't fighting the best people in his weight class who were largely in one championship or in glory. In game one, they found various people for him to fight and he would beat them up. And his game largely revolved around cornering people, working the body, working the head and knocking them out with some slick uppercuts. And he has some really good hands here. So what we saw in the Sidichai fight here is that he's trying to walk down Sidichai and struggling in a circular cage. Sidichai is just so evasive and so good, and he's willing to counter with a knee to the body. He's willing to exchange with you, uh, but it's very hard to corner him against the cage, especially with Masaki Nori, with him walking forward and just taking strikes on his arms and just continuous goal. Con he, he takes strikes on his arms on his high guard block and continues to go forward. It makes a very good target for Sidichai. Now, Masaki Nori was able to cut off him off several times, was able to out footwork him and land hard strikes. And every time he landed, it looked like it was hurting him. His head was completely tilted back or to the side. When he was able to land his crosses and straights, they landed with authority. But it just happened so rarely. But yeah, Sidichai got the nod in this fight. He absolutely outpointed him. He, he beat him in a full kickboxing fight, mixing knees, kicks, uh, punches, straight kicks to the body, like everything that you can have. Sidichai was landing it basically at will against Masaki Nori, who was trying to walk him down, but essentially was just walking into strikes more often than not. But yeah, Masaki Nori still has some pretty good fights in this division for him. He's still likely, especially in a ring, probably can walk down a bunch of these guys. Sidichai is a tough fight for, for anyone, like I was saying last week. That guys like Marak Gregorian or Chingy uh, Zalazov say, and Superbon all say that the most important win of their career is Sidichai, even if he is over the hill at this point. Uh, but yeah, especially if you're going to walk in on him like that and just get countered, yeah, you're, you're going to get beat by him every time that you try something like that. But again, Masaki Nori still had moments in this fight where he looked quite good. You add a lot to the highlight reel because the few times he did land in exchanges, they looked really, really good. Uh, but yeah, what's next for what's going on here? I've heard rumors that one championship is trying to do a Grand Prix in kickboxing with this 155 pound division. Now, whether or not it goes off or not, I really don't know. Or if it will be in kickboxing or will be in Muay Thai, I'm not really sure. And it kind of doesn't have the same steam that it once did because they just did it in 2020 or 2021 or something like that. And it was really, really good with Super Bond and Giorgio Petrosian, stuff like that. So if you do it right now, it does look really good. Uh, you would have people like Shingi Zalazov, Tawanshai, Super Bond. Smokin' Joe Nadawat, Sidichai, Marak Gregorian. Uh, you would have Misaki Noriri in it. And then that's, I think, seven. And then you could add Muhammad Butasa in it as well, who's been on, has some wins in one championship. That's a really good division. Um, I don't know what the status of Shingi Zalazov is. He DM'd me the other day. I don't know if he would participate in a tournament like that. Uh, but yeah, so I, I don't know. But with that, how good that division is, pair them up in any single way, and I'm going to be pretty happy. Um, I, I think Masaki Nori is probably going to struggle against most of the kickers in the division. I don't think he beats Superbon. I don't know that he even beats Smoke and Joe Nadawat. Does he beat Marak Gregorian? That's a great fight. That's that's probably the best fight for him right there. Does he beat Muhammad Butasa? Good fight. Let's sign him up. Let's do it right there. But I think against, uh, yeah, Smoke and Joe, Sidichai, uh, Superbon is probably going to struggle a little bit. But yeah, good fight overall. Catch the highlights if you can. And uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Folks, let's take a quick, quick break here. I'm just going to catch my breath. And then we are going to go into Rise this weekend. And it the main event just looks so, so, so good.
Calf Kick Sports Podcast. This weekend, we have Rise World Series 2024 Osaka going down on June 15th. You can find this fight for free on live on Abima TV. If you miss it, it should be on YouTube pretty quickly after. But my understanding is if you can navigate Abima TV, you can find the fights there for free as well. But in the main event, you have pound for pound implications on the line as the super flyweight champion Kazuki Osaki will take on the recent tournament champion Jin Mandakoro. Kazuki Osaki is a Kazuki Osaki was a Muay Thai-based striker who won national titles in Muay Thai in Japan and then fought for Lumpini Stadium titles when he was in Thailand. And then he came back to kickboxing in Japan and was a great knockout striker. He was a great outpointing striker for quite a while, hitting some pretty great highlights. But he went on a legendary win streak between 2019 right up to 2023 and beating the who's who of this division, right? He captured a title and then defended it, but he beat Toki Tomorrow, Issei Ishii, Kasane, a ton and tons of other skilled people. Most importantly, beat Jin Mandakoro when he was a bit younger. Um, he has one loss to the fighter of the year, Toki Tomorrow, and it was a very close fight, majority decision. So, you know, no shame in that at all. Had a comeback win against Drunsak Bunlana Muay Thai, and that was a close fight as well. But he's such a skilled and tight fighter. He wants to close the distance, make you feel the pressure. He has this high guard, and then he will dig to the body. But he wants to give you no space and attack from the mid-range. He loves jab low kick combination. He likes digging to the body and then coming up to the head. His 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 key really is his timing. Really is just with his heavy hooks how good he is with timing and creating openings for himself. Really good at mixing high and low strikes. Now, Jin Mendicaro is just coming off of quite an impressive year in 2023. You know, when I was thinking of who should win fighter of the year, one of my nominees was Jin Mendicaro because of how good he was. But yeah, he had, he went, and and the reason is because he went from essentially being unranked in a way, you know what I mean? He was just a pretty good fighter in this division. He had losses to Toki Tomorrow and Kazuki Osaki in the past, and um, so he came into 2023 relatively just a middle of the pack kind of guy, got Kasane, was able to defeat him in a really, really close fight, had to go to a split decision round. Uh, he then knocked out Ruben Sione in another tournament reserve fight. And, uh, and then they had a different tournament for him. And then he was able to knock out Ryo Hanoaka and Kaito Hasegawa. And just, yeah, uh, just absolutely insane. He, so he knocked out Ruben Sione, and then they had a different tournament for him. Uh, that was the New Warriors tournament, a one-night tournament, and he knocked out Ryo Hanoaka, and then he defeated Kaito Hasegawa. And those were very impressive wins for a guy that we were kind of talking about being middle of the pack. He's just middle of the road kind of guy. But yeah, his knockout wins over Ruben Sione and Ryo Hanoaka were uh, game-changing. Those are really, really impressive knockout wins from Jin Mandakaro. Now, he does have losses to Kizuki Osaki, and he has won the chance to fight him for the title. I'm sure he wants to pick up the title and avenge that loss. But yeah, he was a pretty young guy coming into this year. Like uh, 2023, God, he would have been like 23 years old or 24 years old or something like that. Like he's a young guy. And so when he lost to Kazuki Osaki, he was young, young. He was maybe 20 or 19 or something like that. And now he wants to avenge that loss, growing into his skills even more. Now their first fight was very close and it went to a draw. So they had a split. Uh, one last round and which I, I love the rules in in most kickboxing where if you go to a draw you have to fight one more round love that i think that's such a good rule but f it let's watch it if the channel gets taken down it was because of this so this was the draw round from the first fight between jin mandakaro and kazuki osaki this was back in 2020 jin mandakaro is in the purple hair with white shorts he has the red cornered gloves kazuki osaki who was ranked on the pound for pound list is in black shorts and the blue cornered gloves you can see him clinching as he is a muay thai fighter there great low calf kick there jab to set it up jin mandakaro is trying to circle around but getting hit by that jab low kick combo look at that timing Two throwing down, but Kazuki Osaki seems to be getting the better of these exchanges, right? Jin is jumping in with different combinations, trying to slug him out, but yeah, Kazuki is too tactical for that. Great punch landed from Jin Mandakoro there. Kazuki Osaki again with the outside leg kick set up from punches. Outside leg kick. Outside leg kick. 
tries to counter with punches, but Kazuki Osaki gets out of the way. Great hook there. Good landing some kicks there. Went high to low, mixed body to head punches there. Ah, Jimin Dekoro, a young man, 19, 20 years old. He's just, he throws with so much power that you can see it coming. You, you can really see it coming is the thing. Uh, but you can see Kazuki Osaki just getting out of the way, letting him drop his guard, and then and then throws him back. Great lead hook. Gets out of the way, no problem. Kazuki Osaki again with the low hook. Ooh, that was a great low, low kick there. Now, this was after three rounds, so both guys are tired. This was the draw round. Now, Jin landed that really well there. Great uppercut from Jin Mandakoro. He's finding the opening through the guard. I'm sure in the rematch, he's going to be targeting that quite a bit. Probably thinks that they have a, a good game plan to beat him. Look at him slugging it out, trying to dodge around the guard, trying to strike around the guard. But Kazuki Osaki lands back with the combination. Trying to time it, but Kazuki Osaki's just shoving him, just hitting him here. Gets out of the way, does a little toss, no problem. Ooh, big hook lands. Trying to land a knee, gets shoved off. Good uppercut, good right hook. Look at that, great kick. Kazuki Osaki landing at will here. Jin Mandakaro, no quitting him, trying to land punches back, but finding no target. Again, digging to the body. Great work from Jin. There it is. That's the end of the round there. You can see in this draw round. So the fight was predicated on the result of this round. Kazuki Ozaki clearly got the better of him, but it was a very fun, very exciting round. So now these two at that pretty much close to the highest point of their career, certainly the highest point of Jin Mandakoro's career. Um, but yeah, Kazuki Ozaki is still one of those guys that is certainly qualified for the pound for pound list, given how good his skills are and how good his resume has been for the last couple of years. But yeah, Jin Mandakaro is right there. So it's going to be a really exciting fight in the Rise World Series this weekend. You also have the lightweight knockout slugger Ken Nakamura will take on Talisan Ferreira. And, I, I, you know, you got to think Ken Nakamura gets a nice, another highlight reel knockout win there. Some other really good fights here in Rise this weekend. Taiga will be fighting Daniel Puertas. That's a really good one. Toki Tamaru will be on it. Uh, Taiju Shitori is on it. Kenta Nanbara is on it. Lots of really good names here. I don't know all of their opponents. Uh, I'm not that much of an expert, but that's why you got to tune in and learn some more about these guys. But yeah, it should be a pretty good card. You also have an open fingered gloves fight on the card as well. So that's going to be great to see. But yeah, great kickboxing card up and down. Let me see if anything else is going on this weekend. Oh, how can I forget? So this weekend you have the K1 Fighting Network Romania 2024. This is hosted by K1 and Warrior Code. So it's going to be hosted by the K1 legend and all-time great Remy Bonyaski. Tons of great fighters on the card, including super heavyweights and heavyweights from different places like Romania, Greece, Italy. You got Sergey Adamchuk. You got different people fighting in the lightweight division. Uh, you got some women's bantamweight and Errol Zimmerman is on it. Akira Jr. is on it. Uh, so yeah, a mix of people on this card. But yeah, check it out. That is available on Warrior code and uh, you can buy it right there i think you can watch it on digisport if you are in romania uh, but yeah check it out on wikipedia you can check it out on warrior code and make sure to watch that it's gonna be a banger folks i do appreciate your time this was a big one we had boo account we had a big glory tournament we had one one six seven with a mix of kickboxing and muay thai and then we have a really good rise fight this weekend um, and then check out the k1 fighting network romania here uh, upcoming this weekend folks appreciate your time my name is tim wheaton with uh, Kick Weekly. Uh, just remember, I'm going to be going out next week and the week after. I'm in Canada visiting some family. So it's probably last episode until July. I'll see if I can get some other people in. But I think beyond, sorry, but I think Inside Kickboxing will have a show on their network talking about some of the Rise fights. I'll talk to them and we'll see <laughs> what goes on. But yeah, I am out until almost July. Folks, enjoy the fights. I hope you enjoyed these last ones. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.